Hello everyone, the Instant Camera Guy here, and welcome to what should hopefully be an interesting video. I have been sent two SX70 Model 1 cameras by a client of mine named David, and both are in fairly sorry condition. But I thought this would be an interesting video just to highlight um, some of the things I guess sort of to look out for if you're buying an SX70 and you want to have it refurbished because I certainly see a lot of people online pay top dollar for something that is really cosmetically in great condition. But is that necessarily the best thing to do? Well, I hope this video goes into some of my thoughts and explanations on that topic. Before I dive into that, I want to thank Matt Stott for his donation on my coffee account. Uh, he bought me a beer or two and basically said thanks for showing him how to disassemble an SLR 680. Um, my absolute pleasure, Matt. Uh, as always, if you like the content that I do, feel free to leave a donation, a like, a subscribe, a comment, really any way that you want to support me, I am absolutely chuffed with, um, because really this is pretty much my full-time gig now, and it's what I do, and I've dedicated the better part of my spare time to doing so, so I always appreciate your support, because simply put, without it, I couldn't do this. I couldn't fix these cameras. I couldn't run this little channel. I couldn't be the instant camera guy. So I wanted to thank all of those viewers that have been supporting me from the beginning and to any of my new supporters that have discovered me purely through YouTube. Now, what we've got here is two SX-70s in very drastically different cosmetic condition. I'm gonna open them up in a second and give a bit of B-roll, but the camera on the left here is in very, very nice cosmetic condition. Um, the lens is nice and clean, the body is in good nick, the chrome is fairly shiny, the original leather is okay. And on the right hand side, we have a camera that is uh, the opposite of that. Um, we have a camera which, if I get the lens over here, which is an absolute mushroom farm in terms of lens fungus. We've got pitted metal on basically every surface. We have just a huge amount of dirt and debris, a filthy viewfinder, a camera that looks for all intents and purposes very, very sad. So my question to you is if you were on eBay or in an antique store, which one would you purchase? The one on the left likely will be going for more money because cosmetically it's very nice. The camera on the right looks like it spent some time living at the bottom of the ocean and very likely will be cheaper. So what would you purchase? Well, if you chose the camera on the left, check this out. <laughs> We've got a busted door latch and a motor that constantly runs. This camera is completely non-functional. Let's try the boat anchor camera. And we actually have something that functions. <laughs> so where I'm trying to go with this is regardless of the condition of the camera, SX-70s, as I've said numerous times on this channel, are filled with flaws. They had things like weak door latches, motor couplers that would snap. They had things like PCBs that would go bad. They had lots of different design issues that ideally need to be rectified for these things to work properly. So if your intent is to purchase one of these cameras and send it to a technician such as myself to fully overhaul and refurbish, well, regardless of the condition that it arrives in, I'm pretty much gonna be doing the same level of work, give or take a few small things. So really, there's no point trying to go out of your way to find the most pristine SX-70 that you can, because a lot of times you're gonna overpay for what may end up being non-functioning garbage. Now, fortunately, both of these cameras have issues that are rectifiable, but I just wanted to make that point because I have clients constantly overpay for cameras that need overhauling. Just in this last week, I've had two clients spend upwards of 500 Australian dollars on cameras that needed to be completely torn down by myself and rebuilt from the ground up because they had a plethora of issues. So I'm just trying to make my point clear that 
The best way to get an SX70 and guarantee a good working condition one is to just buy really any SX70 and send it to a competent technician such as myself. And if you want to send a camera my way, all the links to do so are in the description below. Simply get in touch with me over social media or email me or something like that. Get in touch and we'll chat about refurbishing your camera. Um, but certainly what I want to focus on today is the really rough condition camera because I want to show you that pretty much every single time you see a camera that's in rough condition, it can be restored to really nice condition. Um, most of the time you can get these working. There are, of course, uh, the odd time where you're going to get critical things that are wrong with the camera, for example, if the taking mirror is heavily oxidized, but that hasn't actually happened from what I can see in this particular camera. It's just very dirty. So what I'm trying to say, you really can't judge a book by its cover here. And I tend to find the success rate of clients buying a camera online and it being pretty much e like able to be refurbished without using any spare parts is around 95%. About 90 to 95% of the cameras that I get sent require very minimal spare parts in order to get working. And it's actually the nice cosmetic one that's gonna need the spare parts. I already have a door latch to put into it, but we're not gonna do that on this video. Uh, you guys have already seen me do a door latch in the first SLR. Um, SX70 video that I did. So I'm really just going to put that over to the side and we're going to focus our attention on this little guy. Um, before I do that, I will actually just take the B-roll and do a bit of a before and after. Um, so I'm just going to show you guys, I'm just going to get out my phone here, set it to video and we'll just record a little bit of what these two cameras look like. So uh, to the left here, we have the camera that's in very good shape other than the fact that the door keeps falling off. This camera is very clean. Um, apparently the story goes behind this camera is that David went to purchase it off someone locally and the guy dropped it. And that's why the door is broken. And so David ended up getting it actually for a very cheap price. But for, my, uh, for all intents and purposes here, uh, this is very uh, indicative of the kind of cameras that most of my clients try and seek out. Like a lot of people on eBay pay a premium for these unrefurbished SX-70s because they just simply don't know any better. They think that cosmetics is the most important thing. And they end up with non-functional cameras. Now let's compare it to this, the Swamp Monster here, which looks super duper gross. Look at that, there's just so much fungus. There's also like just a huge amount of dirt, like this is so grimy. Uh, there's a lot of pitting on the metal. I really hope this is gonna show up on camera. Um, I always tend to find like on YouTube, a lot of these restoration videos like there's no emphasis on just how bad things are. Um, unless you get one of those fake restoration videos. My God, are those annoying. You guys know, know the videos I'm talking about where like, it's usually people from like Southeast Asia, they'll pick up some old hi-fi and, and claim they found it on like the side of a road in a rice paddy at some farm and then they'll, they'll refurbish it. Yeah, such a load of nonsense. What they're clearly doing is taking a working one and defurbishing it to make it look dirty and then they do all the footage in reverse. Anyway, um, I digress. Let's get this thing cleaned up, shall we? So effectively what I'm gonna do, I, I wanna try and show that even the rough condition leather on this can be salvaged. Um, really the main problem with this leather is it's just simply very dirty. Uh, it's very, very unclean and, and simply warm soapy water will, will clean a lot of that up. I'll save that to the last, very last step. Um, I also need to re-glue some of this leather because it is coming off at the top. Um, but the old debate of whether or not you should re-skin or de-skin a camera is an old one and really it's up to personal preference. When I see a camera like this that's in that bad a condition, I, I, what I really like to do is just have it stay sort of as original as possible. Sometimes it's nice to show off that even when these things look like they're on the brink of death, they can be brought back. And of course the advantage to salvaging the original leather on the camera is, of course it reduces costs 
It's better for the environment because it's recycling, it doesn't rely on any new animal products, so no cows must be sacrificed for their new leather. Um, and of course, it just keeps the camera completely original. So if that's something that you value as a high level of importance, then it is certainly possible to salvage the leather. And now, a compact, folding, electronically controlled, motor-driven, single-lens, reflex camera. And now, a compact, folding, electronically controlled, motor-driven, your left hand out. Place the camera across the palm. Grasp the rear of the viewfinder cap. Pull the camera into its erect position. Press and the door opens. Take the 10 picture film pack and push it all the way in. Close the door and automatically the cover sheet will be ejected from the salvaged leather panel. Now I've got a few bits of waxed paper from Aki Asahi products and what I like to do, I like to just grab like my little contact cleaner which is a cylindrical can and I like to just re-roll the leather back into shape just using it as a guide and of course once we uh, re-stick it back on um, what I'll do is I'll use a combination of the original adhesive that's oh, that's on the camera because Polaroid used like a double-sided tape. So I'm not going to remove any of that. What I will do is add some extra adhesive to the parts where it's not as spread. And I'm going to keep all the adhesive on here because uh, basically if you take shellite or lighter fluid and wipe a layer of that on this particular adhesive, it's going to remelt the adhesive and what it'll actually do is it'll stick back down. So if you then combine that with some contact adhesive, it's a really good way of salvaging the original panels. Um, but as with everything that I do, I do make that look quite easy. Um, it's quite challenging to do so. So uh, if you screw up, 
you'll probably just have to reskin the camera. But that's pretty much the hardest part done. Um, I'm going to turn the soldering iron on and I'm just going to hang my knife up. And what I'm going to do is put some penetrating oil on the screws. Now someone messaged me before having trouble with taking out the screws and he, and he basically said, look, do you ever just drill them out if you can't get them out? And truth of the matter, it shouldn't ever really come to that, um, provided that you take your time with using the appropriate technique. Um, you shouldn't ever really have an issue. Uh, now I did this in, uh, I think I spoke about this in the other video that I'm doing at the moment, which I don't believe I've uploaded as, as of the time I've recorded, but I've got a little video coming out where I'm refurbishing some gold SX-70 sonars. And I talk a little bit about that technique in that video, but one easy way to remove some of the adhesive that gets into these screws is with a soldering iron and you just kind of burn away the original glue. I've only just turned my soldering iron on so it's not very hot yet. But this is certainly a good technique. Where people have issues stripping screws is it's because um, the glue that holds the leather on basically gets under the head of the screw and it really sticks it to the body of the camera. So a bit of penetrating oil in there would just help release any rust or any adhesive. But the other thing that really helps is to use a soldering iron, especially in the head of the screw where the tool goes. And that just burns any glue that's hiding in there so that your tool's gonna to be able to be inserted easily into the head of the screw. And again, it's just a matter of taking your time with this. Like if you feel like you're having to force something, stop, go have a cup of tea, Reevaluate your life choices and try again. <laughs> I think that's just pretty good advice overall, isn't it? Just stop, have a think. There must be a better way. And there we go. So that's the first one out. Um, the other thing that I talked about in terms of technique with removing screws is the sharp twist. So pressing down and giving a very fast twist helps break some of that adhesive rather than trying to do it slowly with a lot of power. If you move it very quickly it tends to release a lot better. Now the other thing I should say is that the tips I'm using for my screwdriver, uh, this is a Model 1 camera but it's actually the final generation of Model 1's right before they turned it into an Alpha. and. As a result, it uses square-headed screws. So I've got my proper square-headed screwdriver. Um, these were bits that a technician, years and years ago, he had these custom made by a factory. These are high tensile bits. And they cost about 75 Australian dollars each at the time. So I bought two of them and they have been very, very good. I used to custom make my own bits, but simply put a factory with high tensile parts um, <laughs> just does a much better job than I can ever do. And here we get to the paradox of the SX-70 in that, you know, you just really can't tell what the inside of the camera is going to be like based on the outside. This is minty fresh in here. I don't understand how all of the corrosion seem to just stick to the outside and not affect the inside at all. Like it's all gone into the shutter and not to the body. There's hardly, there's like not a speck of rust here on any of the chassis. Um, and this is precisely what I was talking about at the start of the video. There's really, there is just no point trying to find these mint condition SX-70s with flawless lenses and, you know, just showroom condition because odds are they're gonna need the same amount of work as this thing anyway. Now the only thing I would recommend you not do is if you are in the market for an SX-7 and you find one, try not to get one with damaged body panels. Like if you can see a panel's clearly cracked in half, then I would only be paying a very cheap amount for that camera because if I've got to replace a, a panel, it's gonna have to come from another spare parts camera and that will increase the cost of repair.
but we're just taking the shutter apart. I've already spoken to uh, David, the client, and let him know that I was going to start work on his uh, camera today. Um, I do apologize, by the way, if you can hear people talking and shouting in the background. Uh, my neighbors are having some kind of work done on the yard, and uh, they are a vocal bunch. Um, yeah, this, this really is, this truly is the final generation of SX-70 Model 1. This actually has a very unique shutter design. Um, I spoke a bit about this on one of my other videos, uh, where, oh, also where I took fungus out of a lens, funnily enough. And what we spoke about was that Polaroid changed the flash fire assembly design many, many times over their run of cameras because people kept complaining about how the flash worked. Um, so story was, the very first generation of SX-70 cameras had what they call fill flash. So that is, if you insert a flash bar, the flash will always fire regardless of the weather. Um, so if it's bright and sunny, the flash will still fire. Well, people didn't like that um, because it wasted their flash bulbs, so people complained. And Polaroid thought, well, to make things easier then, we'll put a little circuit in where if the electric eye measures that there's a lot of light, then the flash won't fire. Um, but then a lot of people complained about that, and so Polaroid couldn't win, and in the end, with the SX-70 Alpha, they ended up going back to the original fill flash design. Um, but Polaroid had to use, like, a lot of PCBs, because uh, each PCB had, like, its own dedicated flash fire assembly, basically, which is a little chip that's inside the socket. And you couldn't necessarily use one flash fire assembly with another unless you modified the board heavily. So to get around that, they made this final generation of board, which I believe is compatible with like the alpha style flash fire assembly, um, but is also backwards compatible if you bridge this little part here. So this little terminal on the right hand side, it's got two pads very close to one another, but they don't touch. But if you bridge that, then it does make this PCB compatible with the earlier versions. The other thing that they changed in terms of the flash fire assembly design was something called the sixth flash inhibit. And that is because early flash bars had five bulbs in it. And then once those bulbs were up, you'd swap it. Well, this particular flash fire assembly has what is basically a little detector in it where if it detects that there is not a not a usable bulb, it won't fire the flash. And so that's that's designed not to waste your photo. So uh, anyway, what I'm trying to say here, this particular PCB, that variant where there's that little bridging pad, is really not particularly common and it was only found on the final generation of Model 1. So that would make this probably like a 1976 year camera if I check the serial number. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna focus on the body of the camera first. Um, because after all, that is the beating heart of the camera. <laughs> it's so gross under here. Um, I'll probably clean that in just a second. I'm not even going to look at this viewfinder. It's so disgusting. What? Oh my god. Um, I will just get the motor running first. This motor is in good nick. Um, oh, actually, this has the alpha drive shaft. So there is no plastic coupler on this version. You did see that sometimes in Model 1s, but really only the absolute final few months of production they started doing that. So, yeah, David, this is a very unique camera. Of the two, this is the one I like more. Just because it's got that little bit of history, and it's just a little more interesting. You won't ever really be able to tell this kind of stuff from an external appearance. It's, it's really only something you'll discover if you, um... Or a nerd like me, and if you've opened up enough cameras. But it's cool. Alright, so that is polished. We're gonna clean the end of that. And we're going to clean the brushes in the motor. I'm going to lubricate the bearings and we're going to reassemble it. 
I'm very curious to see what kind of condition the viewfinder mirror is in inside the body of the camera because the actual taking mirror looks really surprisingly free of corrosion. I, I, I can scarcely believe how free of corrosion it is. I'm, uh, I think I'm just going to close the window <laughs> so I can't hear the neighbors. All right, that should be a little bit quieter. All right, let's put this motor back together. Uh, I mean, it was already running fine before, so not strictly necessary in inverted commas, but I'm going to do it anyway give that motor even more power and just increase the life of the camera. All right, I'll put my drive shaft back on. And yeah, this, this particular like hybrid style where you've got the early model motor and the later model uh, drive shaft is cool to see. It has been ages since I've worked on one of these particular variants of SX-70. Come on. Now, of course, the disadvantage to the drive shaft and the motor being from different eras of cameras is they are hard to get back together because of the length of the spring in relationship to the drive shaft. I'm just going to get my light so I can see what I'm doing. Makes my life a little bit easier. There we go. We are on, and I can release a bit of that spring now. There we go. Bit of lubricant around the collar. Excellent. All right. So, because this is sort of a hybrid of Alpha and Model 1, um, it does have the lens board that is riveted in place. So I will have to flop the body panels over uh, like I would on a 680 or a Sonar. Oh my goodness. Ugh, so stiff. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Yeah, yeah, the corrosion's making those hinge pins particularly hard to remove. Can I get to it? No. All right. Do I have a bigger screwdriver? Here we go. There we go. Is that enough? There we go. Side cutters make a really good tool for grabbing those hinge pins if they're being particularly stubborn. But every now and again, because you get that corrosion, like this green pitting, it does make those very hard to remove. But again, just take your time. I'll never forget seeing a technician on Instagram using a Dremel to cut up the panel because he couldn't get the hinge pins out. And I was like, what are you doing? Use penetrating oil, use a pick, and take your time. I don't know if he was just making a reel like that for the clout, but oh man. Very odd. Uh, where do I even begin with cleaning this? This is so disgusting. Can you guys see how much, how much schmutz is on here? I'm actually just going to brush this straight into my bin. Yeah, that hardly did anything. Um, I'm gonna give the outside of the bellows a clean, or should I say a scrub like this? Just so dirty, so filthy.
And then the other thing I'm gonna have to decide is what I wanna use to clean this dirty panel because it really looks like the lettering on the sticker is starting to come off. And sometimes that happens. I think it happens due to oxidization, like the, cause it's basically paint on a, a black sticker. That, that's what that lettering is. And sometimes because of oxidization, like a reaction happens between that paint and the sticker and it basically just, the letters wipe off the second that you wipe it with anything. It doesn't always happen. Uh, I tend to find the actual, like the softest thing to clean that with is actually the, the um, shellite. So the camping fluid, camping fuel, lighter fluid basically. So I'm gonna just very carefully attempt that and if the lettering comes off, there's not a lot we can do. But this, yeah, this just happens with the stickers sometimes. Now that that's actually miraculously not <laughs> destroying everything. The lettering is still very much there. But yeah, this sticker is in very rough shape. Well, that's certainly cleaner than it was. I'm gonna give it one more run just with a slightly softer cloth. And again, this comes back to the debate of when you refurbish something, do you try and make it look like it rolled off the factory showroom or do you leave a little bit of history behind because it tells the life of the camera? Personally, I like both. There's no right or wrong way to do a refurbishment. It's, it's really just up to the client preference. But in this particular case, like with these cameras, this camera is just speaking to me, saying, you know what, let's get me working, but I wanna kinda look original. I can't explain why. I just think this, this camera is a good candidate for it, just to show, you know, what a good refurb can do and how much you can bring back to life a camera that otherwise looked ruined. So, we'll pop. The other thing is you could always reskin this in the future. There's like, it's gonna be very easy to swap the skin. It's gonna be a lot harder to reskin it and then put the original skin back on. So yeah, my preference in this particular scenario is to keep it with that original sticker, with that original skin. I know some companies like Brooklyn Film Camera, when they have a sticker that's a little damaged like this one is, they like to replace it. They've got their own branded sticker, I think, that says like refurbished by Brooklyn Film Camera. Personally, I don't like that kind of stuff. Um, I prefer at least the branding to stay as true to Polaroid's original as possible. I know like another company called Polar Studio, they, they manufacture new stickers and they're all branded. And I, I don't want stickers that are branded by a third party. I, I'm yet to see someone that actually makes and sells like original style Polaroid stickers without some weird third party branding. I don't mind branding, but keep it somewhere that's not super visible. Keep it a bit subtle, you know? All right. We're nearly inside, which should be exciting. All right, we've got quite a dirty mirror and Fresnel assembly, but honestly, nothing that's super bad. I've certainly seen worse. I'm just gonna pop the mirror. Now, somewhat miraculously, the taking mirror is actually in surprisingly good condition. Like, I don't know how that happened. Um, so we've got one mirror that's really dirty, one mirror that's particularly clean. So somewhat of a miracle, I guess. But we'll just see how much more clean we can get it. I'm just brushing some of the dust away. And then I'm gonna, uh, we'll obviously check this mirror. 
But all the silicon is holding in really well, and that makes sense. This is a very late model uh, SX70 Model 1. Generally, this generation of cameras, the... Um, What's the words I'm looking for? The silicon is in good shape. Yeah, for how beat up <laughs> this camera was, this mirror is in like way too good a shape. <laughs> At the end of last year, right before Christmas, I was refurbishing some cameras for an Indonesian client of mine, and their camera was the opposite of this. They had the most mint condition cosmetic camera I'd ever seen, but every aspect of the mirror pathway was destroyed. And I mean, beyond repair. Now, I'm gonna message David whilst I'm cleaning this because I don't know if he wants a rule of third grid added, so I'm just gonna quickly ask him and hope he responds. So I'm just gonna say here, hey David, you want a rule of third grid in the viewfinder. He messages back pretty quickly usually, so hopefully I get an answer. Well, he's seen the message. So I'm just coming in here with a big cloth to start off with. Just because there's a lot of like, there's a lot of what appears to be like dirt. I don't know how dirt would have ever found its way inside the viewfinder assembly. Like it, it really looks like soil, you know? I wonder if it's some kind of remains of like fungus or mildew, hard to know. Whatever it is, we have to clean it up. And really get this thing looking spick and span. All right. Yeah, it's good to see that the silicon's in good shape. Now this mirror does have some oxidization on it, but it is fortunately only at the edges. So when you actually look through the viewfinder, this really won't have an effect. So this is good for David. Uh, David has just messaged back and asked how much. What he doesn't know is it's totally complimentary for me to add a rule of thirds grid. Um, and my rationale for that is, well, it's pretty easy for me to do while I'm already here, and it literally just involves using a pencil, so... <laughs> I, I don't really want to charge for it. It's just uh, a little bonus thing that you can have should you have your camera overhauled by me. I like it. I really like it. I've got rule of thirds grid on my personal cameras. Uh, and it is something that I recommend if you do like the uh, composition benefit that you get from having the grid. Oh my goodness, this mirror is so filth. It's so grotty. I'm just smearing dirt around at this stage. I know it's probably hard to see on the camera. But trust me, there's like really grubby bits on this mirror. I'm probably gonna have to go and completely clean my cloth after this, because it's just, ah, oh, it's just so freaking gross. <laughs> so freaking gross. What is on here? Whatever it is, is just kind of like smearing around. All right, that's a bit better. But yeah, I, I would recommend a rule of thirds grid for this camera because the Fresnel screen has 
like just so much fungus and marks on it, it will actually help distract from how filthy the, the Fresnel is. So we'll clean the Fresnel first. Uh, the Fresnel does not need any of the rubber tongue cut down to size, again because this is really that generation of SX-70 Model 1 where they were literally just finishing up spare parts before they released the Alphas and the tongue is already cut to the uh, modern correct shape. Now there's some mottling to this Fresnel screen. That's nothing that I can fix, that's due to oxidization. But it won't really affect the overall image. You might be able to notice it a little bit if it was super bright sun. but it's nothing that'll affect things too much. Yeah, this is actually scrubbed up better than I thought it would have. Which is nice, that's good to see. All right, I'll grab my pencil, I'm just gonna sharpen it. And grab the ruler and we'll get to work. So I'm just gonna grab it off the wall here. Put the file back. I think I described in a previous video that for some reason this ruler happens to be the exact same width as one third of the Polaroid screen. I guess that means that this ruler is like an inch wide and this is a three by three inch screen pretty much. So it is like the perfect size to do this grid and it looks great when it's done. Just gonna add the other lines, and then we can pretty much box this up. I'll put together the body of the camera, probably put it off to the side, and we'll start work on the viewfinder and then the shutter. go. One grid added in, making the camera just that little bit more usable. Uh, I will just polish that rear hinge switch. Actually, on the subject of switches, if you've ever opened up a copy of the Polaroid repair manual, you'll see that Polaroid names all of their switches S and then a number. Um, you will never hear me use those numbers. Reason being, I don't like it. I have a, a human anatomy background and I find it very frustrating when things are named to some weird arbitrary convention that doesn't make logical sense. And the fact is that Polaroid has all these different switches in the camera. They've got a switch here, a switch here, a switch here, uh, a switch in the shutter but they just named them like in no particular order. At first you might think like, oh, they're naming it from the front of the camera to the rear. Nope, they just named them all willy nilly. Um, it makes them very hard to remember. And so I just never use the names officially because I, like I'm inside these things all the time and I can't even remember the damn names of the switches and I repair these daily. So what I do is I name them by the position. So rear hinge switch, anterior sliding arm switch, 
posterior sliding arm switch, shutter button switch, flash switch. Like, I just name them for where they are. Front door switch. Like, <laughs> isn't that a much better naming convention? So, if you're wondering why I don't go like, oh yeah, I'm just polishing the S4 switch and we're gonna check the S5 switch and it's because I hate those numbers. Like I, I do not like the naming convention of the switches. I find it totally useless. Um, there's no rhyme or reason. They're difficult to remember. It just adds a little layer of complication to what is an already overly complicated camera to repair. So you won't see me using those names. So if you've ever wondered why that is the case, well, that is why. Uh, this does have an alpha style metal tongue in the door. Um, I haven't decided yet whether or not, because my client David, he wants one of these cameras to be an SX70 camera and then he wants the other one to be 600 converted. I haven't decided which one I'm gonna do as which. Because if one's gonna stay an SX70 camera, I might leave the tongue in there. I'll probably just ask David. Um, and if he does want the tongue removed, I'll just remove it right at the end before I assemble the camera. So um, yeah, I really, because I haven't checked the shutters yet. I mean, I know the shutter in this particular camera works, but I don't know how accurate it is. I haven't seen the electric eye. I haven't measured the capacitor. So I don't know whether or not this is gonna be like the better candidate for SX-70 or 600 mod. Because if, like, if the electric eye is really bad, like really, really bad, I might just decide to do a 600 capacitor mod with a really tiny capacitor to, to compensate for that uh, electric eye corrosion. Because it's a very easy way to do it. I haven't decided yet. But that's why I'm going to leave the tongue in for now. But that pretty much does the body of the camera. I'm going to hit pause there, take a drink, and we'll come back and tackle this very gross viewfinder which is so gross, I think it's gonna need a bit of B-roll. Alrighty, we are back and I have a very filthy viewfinder to repair. Very, very filthy, very gross, super disgusting. Uh, it really, like, it makes me wonder how was this camera stored that it got this gross? Like a lot of the dirt that's on here, comes off pretty easy just with like a wet cloth. So it's not even, it's not even like we're dealing with corrosion here per se. We're just dealing with grime. Like, like, I don't know if you, I hope this shows up in the camera that there's like this very dirty edge to the leather here and just a wet cloth is cleaning it off. So that, that just goes to show how disgusting this thing is. I am going to rip it apart. Uh, because the curved mirror is so filthy. So, so filthy. Uh, it also actually seems, opening this up, it does seem, yeah, like there's a bit of insect debris here. Ew. And there's a very small crack on like the non-functional part of the plastic on the rear of the hinge here. I might just get a little bit of super glue in there. It's not like a functional part, like the hinge pin isn't gonna fall out or something like that and it's not on the thick part, but I should probably do that just as a bit of a preemptive measure, just in case that crack ever got worse. Oh, this is so disgusting in here. What I like to do is use a big brush to brush away, dry some of the um, the looser bits of debris before I use a cloth. Um, the reason being, if you wet some of this debris, you'll just kind of smear it around. Whereas a dry cloth, you actually flick it off and get rid of it. Um, I think I'm gonna <laughs> take this, take this spring off as well and get rid of oh. <laughs> get rid of the mirror completely because it's so filthy under here. Ew. Oh yeah, this, like, it's, it's like, I don't even, it's like it sat outside. It's like soil. <laughs> it's like someone buried this thing. 
It's <laughs> so disgusting. Oh, man. It is legitimately like someone buried this thing in the yard and it filled up with soil at some stage. Um, so what, I, what I'll do is just with my damp cloth here, I'm just going to, while I've got it apart, just clean some of the... Um, clean some of the edges where it's just really grimy. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I'll re-glue that little piece on. Just that one there that's cracked. Like I said, it's, it's not functional, so it doesn't matter so much, but I will just glue that little piece back on. And we'll clean up the mirror while I've got this apart. And yeah, then I'll put this thing back together. There we go. Look how clean that mirror is comparative to how it was before. But yeah, at the rear of the um, at the rear of the uh, viewfinder mechanism, there's two little loops that the hinge pins go into. Um, there's a, a a larger, fatter one on one side and a thinner one on the other side. And it is fairly common that they end up with little cracks and things. The edge that's cracked off is fortunately just the guiding edge. It doesn't really hold the bulk of that pin in, so this viewfinder will still work completely fine. But I'm just going to re-glue it back in just so that... Oh... <laughs> There's like insect eggs on the inside of the blinds. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, that's really gross. Eh. <laughs> oh. oh, that is so rank. Oh, that is not what I wanted to feel on the tips of my fingers. <laughs> okay, so let's just clean these blinds. Uh, yeah, this viewfinder is a biohazard. Oh, man. You know, I didn't even... It was so dirty, I didn't even bother putting the camera up to my eye to look through it. I could see how hazy it was from a distance, and I was like, no. Nah. I'm not putting my eye on that thing. It's going to get an infection, and I'm very glad that I didn't. All right. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to re-glue that bit. I'm going to come back when this thing's fully assembled, and we're going to work on the shutter, okay? Shutter time. Now, this shutter is super-duper filthy, so it will require a full overhaul. Uh, stripped back to... Basically as, as strict as we can get it. Um, now one of the things I will have to do, because there is so much fungus in the lens, is separate the optical cells. Um, also interestingly, this camera has square-headed screws for the light dark wheel. That is not a common thing to find on SX70 cameras. Um, and they're very hard to remove. Uh, in fact, when you find these square-headed studs that go into these particular variants, um, I actually may just dremel them out completely and replace them because these are nearly impossible. So, uh, <laughs> well, that was a quick little segment to the video. I'm gonna be back because this, uh, this light dark wheel is gonna be very difficult to remove. Hold it right there. All right, I just got out one. Um, yeah, basically, Polary didn't use this screw for very long. This is effectively a scrivet with a square head. Uh, scrivets are a cross between like a screw and a rivet. It's got a 45 degree carved thread and it pushes in kind of like a nail. Unfortunately, the square headed screwdriver that they used does not provide enough torque to really ever get them out again. So. I'm literally just going to throw those screws straight in the bin and grab some others from my spare parts when it comes time to reassembling this camera. But effectively, I, I mentioned in a previous video that you should never really ever have to take a Dremel to an SX-70. Well, this is one exception to that rule. These screws are basically impossible. And they make repair of this particular camera very, very difficult. And they gotta go. 
but carving them into a flathead, you can then get enough torque on them to remove them. So yeah, that will need to be replaced with spares. Anyway, on to the rest of the build. All right, so a little update. I've decided I have to rechange my approach to David's camera. Um, unfortunately, his lens cell, so I've gone to separate the two halves of the lens cell, and I've realized that David lucked out by getting a specification of camera that's actually quite rare, and that is the crimped metallic lens cell. So the front and the rear of the, the rear triplet part of the lens most of the time on an SX-70 Model 1 or a Model 2 is held in place with epoxy. Polaroid experimented with this crimped design for a while. They are very uncommon to see, but unfortunately that's what this particular camera has. So I'm going to need to completely swap out that lens cell because although you can separate the crimped cells as I have here, I find they're never quite the same when they go back together. You'll never get them as good as the factory machinery was capable of doing. Whereas the epoxy versions, you can, because you simply just re-glue them. So that means the entire PCB is going to come off the back of the camera. I've already started desoldering some things. And uh, yeah, we're going to need to swap out the lens cell completely. So actually quite a lot of work. Uh, it does mean that there will be less fungus in the lens, because I'll obviously be putting a spare in which hasn't been as badly affected. I will try and recycle David's front lens housing, um, but because the lens cells have come from two, uh, two separate cameras, I will need to reset his uh, uh, focusing scale because the way that the lens cells line up doesn't always match. There we go, just getting that off like so. And we're also going to need to remove the solenoid. Now the solenoid has this little uh, piece insulated by Kapton, which is put there from the factory. Um, it's easiest to just remove that part when it comes to then desoldering the solenoid, because I will have to at the very least lift those legs. The solenoid can very likely just stay in place there, but I do have to at least detach the legs so I can remove this PCB. And then we'll be putting the PCB back in place. Well, this video has turned into quite the struggle. What was going to be a relatively easy cleaning of the lens has proven to all of a sudden become a full shutter rebuild. Um, fortunately, these lenses are pretty rare. I do not come across them very often. And I haven't really been able to find much information in any factory bulletins either. Like there's very little mention of those type of lens cells anywhere in the literature that I've ever discovered. So I don't know how rare that particular variant is. I don't know like what year they were used on, etc. Uh, but we will need to remove this lens housing. And it's just held in place with two screws. Now, oddly enough, Polaroid has holes for three screws. But clearly decided at some stage that two was more than enough to hold that lens cell in. Um, so yeah, this crimped together set of cells, I'm, I'm literally just going to bin it because it's very difficult to work with. Uh, earlier Model 1 cameras had, like this is just classic cost reduction for Polaroid, right? The very first generation of Model 1s had four screws with four screw holes. And then they decided, ah, you know what? Three is enough to hold it in. And then they decided, nah, two is enough to hold it in. So you can see like Polaroid's train of thought in the cost reduction process the further along they got into production. And I mean, that surely must have saved, you know, literally cents. <laughs> mm. 
Now, I might have to choose a different lens cell here at the moment because this one that I've taken off a busted spare camera is refusing, just refusing to let go. So this actually might be too far gone as well. I'm really raiding the spare parts here in order to get this thing to work. Uh, let's see, can I use this Torx head? Yeah, those are really fused in there. The oxidization has basically bound at least two of these screws to the aluminium housing. So I, oh, I may have to get a heat gun out penetrating all the whole works in order to release that. Uh, so I'm just gonna struggle a little bit with that off camera and I'm gonna come back once I have this lens cell liberated. All right, lens cell has been liberated. It ended up being a case of the heat gun to the rescue. After blasting the rear of this aluminum panel with heat, it was clearly enough to loosen whatever was bonding those screws together and uh, be enough for me to liberate the lens cell. Now this lens cell actually comes off of a camera that I have already sort of half, I had already half refurbished before noticing that the chassis had some kind of critical failure. I can't exactly remember the reason why I ended up abandoning this shutter, but I kept it in the spare parts knowing that at least one day it would end up being needed and today is that day. So it is pretty clean already. Overall, the condition uh, is good. And so I will be able to install it into this camera's uh, housing. And I'll be recycling the original screws that came off of David's camera. And then we'll just simply have to resolder on the PCB. All right, so one completely new lens cell. Uh, one of the things I will need to do is separate the little logo from this particular lens cell because uh, when the new one goes on, yeah, it's very unlikely that it's gonna line up just because it comes from a completely different camera. Uh, but that's okay, that's easy enough to do. Uh, what I need to do is again, bust out the heat gun get a sharp knife, and the logo on the front is really just a sticker. And then once I've found calibration, we're just simply gonna glue the sticker back in place. So that it's correct and infinity is where it's supposed to be. Here we go. So with heat, that comes completely off. All right, let's get this thing cleaned up and start putting it back together. First up, I've got to get rid of the absolute mushroom farm that is on this lens. And it's so bad the B-roll's coming out. Let's just uh, enlarge that a little bit. There we go. Really gross. Obviously the new cell that I've installed into the camera is in good shape other than some dust on the front which I need to clean. Uh, but this, really disgusting. So let's get everything cleaned up. Get the lens on the camera, get the aperture blades on the camera, get the PCB on the shutter, and then we can assemble everything uh, once the little piece on the viewfinder has dried, I did end up gluing that little cracked piece back on. And so I'll, ref I'll basically put this camera back together a little later in the afternoon. Uh, the PCB ended up being in pretty good shape overall, like the electric eye uh, was quite crusty, but it has cleaned up rather nicely. So I'm happy about that. And Really all I need to do, and I'll, once I do the other camera, I'll, uh, I'll make a decision, but I basically just need to figure out what camera I'd like to 600 convert. 
and I'll probably just do that at the end and then one will be left stock as SX70 and the other will be 600 modded. All right, now let's clean the dust out of this cell. And uh, as I was saying, I took the um, little logo, the little front distance dial, the, the sticker off the front of the cell. And that's something that you will just have to do if you're swapping lenses from one camera to another, because the little helicoid, it rarely ever lines up 100% the same. So you have to take off the distance markers and recalibrate them to infinity. So that's something that I'll do once I've got the camera assembled and I can see through the viewfinder, is I'll line up a view of infinity and just make sure the sticker is aligned properly. Not super hard to do, but just something that I have to do once everything's together. Great. So I'm just trying to make sure this lens is as clean as possible. This is obviously the lens cell that had all the fungus on it. roll of that just so that you can see a little before and after. No fungus. Very cool stuff. All right, uh, let's put the blades in. Starting with the lower blade. Uh, as I said, these blades don't require any um, they don't require any uh, graphite to be put on them, like the other blades that I've been showing off. And the reason for that is that these are alpha spec blades and they already come coated in like this waxy material that prevents them from sticking. Uh, you'll find this on alpha and sonar cameras, but typically not on a Model 1 and a Model 2 but being that this is the final ever generation of the Model 1, uh, they are present. But yeah, the, the very final generation of Model 1 cameras, uh, this one got the lottery and ended up with the most frustrating parts, <laughs> like across the board. It ended up with the uh, square-headed, um, I put the wrong blade in, hang on. Uh, it ended up with the square-headed light dark wheel screws. It ended up with the crimped lens cell. It ended up basically getting the lottery that was the worst possible parts to make this thing uh, you know, easy to repair, basically. There we go. Uh, what I'm doing, I'm taking out the blade because I realized I put the wrong one in accidentally. The one that is supposed to go in first has a little brass pin up the top. If you do it the wrong way around, uh, the blades can catch, and that is not something that you want. I was wondering why it didn't feel right going in, and, well, it's because I was putting the wrong blade in. That's why it didn't feel right, because it wasn't right. Check that off camera there, beautiful. And let's put that PCB back together. So I took the liberty off screen of just uh, taking all the crustiness off of the uh, little electric eye. And now the tricky part, just trying to align all the little legs 
for the solenoid. All right, let's solder this back together and come back with a finished product. All right, let's fold down all the pins onto the board and solenoid legs too. Uh, actually, what I have to do, I'm just gonna trim the ends of those solenoid legs because they're a little long. And that's because they had that little, that little piece that uh, was covered in capped on tape that I mentioned before. That's there for basically the factory tool that would have pressed it in back in the day. Now, because I'm doing this by hand, we no longer need them to be as long. And in fact, leaving them that long just risks short circuiting things. So I'm just trimming them down to size and now we can put those solenoid legs back on. Uh, we'll put that part of Sol 2 back together as well. This is very likely the camera I'll leave as a 670 film. So let's get my solder over here and re-solder everything. Now this is a good example of why I just don't like taking the PCB off unless I absolutely have to. On this particular camera, I ended up needing to because the lens cell just was not really one that I could easily repair, being the crimped design. I much prefer not having to, uh, well, just not having to do this much soldering if I can get away with it. Because every time you have to remove that PCB, you just do introduce that small risk of lifting a trace or something not going back together quite as well as it went in the first place. All right, we'll put our uh, now completely blank lens back on the camera. And I'll probably just get this thing assembled down to the point of being able to put on the light dark wheel. Of course, I do need to rummage through my spares and figure out what parts I have to make this thing complete. So I'll put on the flash cam assembly first. Looping it underneath the lever of solenoid number two. Put the little plastic washer on that holds that in place. Next thing that can go on is the walking arm. Like so. And then after that will come the spring-loaded infinity post. If it wants to go in. There we go. Now the infinity post. And I'll just put on the focusing wheel for now. 
just really to keep that infinity post in position. Obviously this lens is going to be nowhere near calibrated at the moment because, well, it doesn't have a scale, I can't see where infinity is, and I need to go outside and do that. But I've got to put it on the camera first. And really just what I want to do at this point is make sure that this shutter is operational. So, I'll put it on the body of the camera, uh, just with one screw or so. I really just want to test it at this point, make sure that everything still works. And then I've got to basically just really reassemble this entire thing and give it a jolly good clean. Just one screw should hold it in for now. Now you technically don't need the viewfinder panel on in order to test the shutter, hence why I'm not putting it on. And I've left it over to the side, as I said before, because I am waiting for that glue to dry. I'm just gonna tack on those solder points. I'm not gonna add any extra solder at the moment because it's really just for testing. Great. Shutter is working excellently. Uh, this pick arm certainly needs a good lubrication. I'm just going to do that now. I'm going to grab my, my lithium grease. my little brush. Yeah, this pick arm doesn't click at all. So I've just got a little brush that I'm going to brush the lithium grease onto the tracks until we hear that click. That click is the normal sound that it should be making. I'm just going to use a cloth to wipe off the excess. And now we have a partially assembled SX70 Model 1 late variant. Not 600 converted yet. Um, I will ask David which of the variants, uh, probably at the end, and I'll go back and do the 600 conversion. Um, but yeah, really what I'll be doing now is reassembling this in a little bit once this panel has completely dried at the end. Uh, I've got to touch up um, the end here uh, a little bit black just to hide some of the glue marks. And then once that's done, you'll never be able to tell that it was ever damaged. So, so far, this camera is coming up nice and clean um, other than requiring that new lens cell. Now, had that lens cell been one of the classic Model, uh, Model 1 designs, this camera wouldn't have needed any spare parts. It was really just that that lens cell is very hard to take apart and salvage. It never goes on right once it's taken apart, and you're much better off just swapping it. And it's one of the rare examples where I would actually do that. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna cut and come back and Hopefully you guys will be looking at a finished camera. Well, I ended up finding some scrivets for the light dark wheel. That has now been reattached. What is left is to, I'd probably 600 mod, I do believe we're gonna end up 600 modifying this camera. What's left is to 600 modify this particular PCB, but also to polish the metal body on the actual camera itself because it is quite tarnished and it is something where we're going to really want to make it shine uh, so as to make it look cosmetically as nice as possible. Um, the oxidization is just something that will happen if the camera is stored somewhere particularly moist and it's something that's often unavoidable when you pick up these things uh, and they just haven't been stored so well. So I'm going to use metal polish 
I use a type of polish named Autosol. Uh, I just like the brand. I've had very good results with it in the past, so I stick with it. But any kind of metal polish really should do. Uh, and I'm really just gonna polish up all of the metallic surfaces on the camera. Uh, off camera, while I had a little bit of a cut there, I did end up just going over the camera with a damp cloth, removing a lot of the grime that had built up first. And now I'm just going over all the body panels with the polish to remove as much of the pitting as I can. Now, not all of that pitting is gonna come off. Some may have gone through the metallic layers on the body. I'm really just trying to make this as nice as I possibly can. It may not be able to ever be perfect again, but I'd like to stress once more that these are old cameras. I think it's quite easy to take a look at the futuristic design of the SX-70 and forget that this thing is pushing 50 years old at the time of me making this video. Although they look very space age, they are anything but. They were produced in the 1970s and as a result have all of the expected wear and tear of a product from the 70s. Now usually when it comes to polishing, I like to try and keep the camera together like so. Just be aware that polish might go through some of the little cracks in the body panels and so you will need to open up the camera uh, and just clean out some of the bits where you've been polishing if that is the case. But already this thing is looking way better. I don't know if you guys can see on the camera just how much better it looks like, like for example, this bit, right? This is quite pitted. I don't know if you guys can see just how good it looks after even a little bit of polishing, but it really does go a long way to making the camera look as good as we possibly can. And that is one of the fortunate things about these metal, oh, I should say metal body cameras. It's basically a metallic foil over a layer of plastic, but that is one advantage of these metallic bodied cameras is you can polish them quite well and get them shining when they go dull. Uh, the shutter faceplate I'll do off the camera. I've taken the little light dark wheel off so as to not mark it up. And we really want to come just on all surfaces here and shine it up as good as we possibly can. This really should look pretty much unrecognizable by the time we're finished with it. I ended up cleaning some of the leather too, again, just with a bit of water on a cloth, just to get a lot of the dirt off. I don't know if it shows up just like how much lighter the leather looks. Um, I haven't glued the bottom panel back on because obviously the camera is still disassembled at this point. I really just wanted to take the time now that it's all, well, pretty much all put back together uh, to give everything a polish before we start finalizing everything on this particular build. Nearly done. All right, well, there's no more green on the front shutter, which is really nice. Uh, have I missed any spots on the body? Not really that I can see. One area I will actually pay attention to, which you can only do when this panel is off the camera, is this little bit here. This little edge is constantly hidden by the top body panel. So if you ever want evidence that a camera has only been polished from the outside and not the inside, look for oxidization there, because that's a place a lot of people forget to polish is this little lip on the inside here. It's quite a sharp edge, so do be careful if you're rubbing your fingers backwards and forwards. 
it can be sharp enough to cut you, I know from experience. So make sure you've got plenty of cloth, just to protect your fingers. Alright. And at this stage I'm honestly surprised at just how nicely this is shining up. Um, I mean, you guys saw the before footage. This thing was really grubby. And it's coming along really nicely. All right, so now that that's mainly clean, I now just wanna come back again with my damp cloth and really just get rid of that polish residue. that we've left behind on the metallic panels. Because it's not very nice to touch, to have all that smudgy, uh, slick feeling polish. But it cleans off pretty easy. There we go. What do we think, eh? Looks much nicer than it did before. And of course, we'll do the same thing to the front shutter housing. The shutter that ended up being more difficult than it had any right to be to take apart. All right. Last thing I'll do, I'll just desolder the original capacitor. Get my desoldering gun onto it. Once it's heated up, temperature is slowly climbing. While I was polishing, it just went back on standby mode. But I like to use the desoldering gun where I can. Because it does make removing the capacitors on these just that little bit easier. Getting there. There we go. Took a little longer than usual because I had to wait for it to get hot but I've just taken out the original capacitor, desoldered the legs, and we can put that in my testing rig and come up with an appropriate replacement. I'm gonna guess either a 180 or a 150 picofarad capacitor will make a good replacement for this. But being that this particular PCV variant is Yeah, somewhat of a more weird variant. It's hard for me to know exactly what kind of capacitor it uses. So this uses a 375. A 150 picofarad capacitor should be an excellent drop-in replacement for this in order to convert it to 600 mod. Uh, I am gonna drop that in now and reinstall the shutter, go and film test this thing, box it up, put the little uh, light dark wheel, um, the little electric eye cover back on, reassemble this thing and get it tested and come back and show you guys the finished results. There we have it folks. One refurbished 
formerly incredibly grubby SX70 Model 1, the final generation, right before they introduced the Alpha. Bottom leather panel I've re-glued back on. It looks completely original and I took the liberty of cleaning all of the leather panels. All of the metallic body has been polished. I have ensured that the uh, calibration of the flash cam assembly was correct. Uh, fortunately it was in good order, nothing needed adjusting on that so I'm happy to leave that as is. But it was something that I checked anyway. Uh, the flash assembly fires as it should on all five bulbs. And the camera has been tested with film and revealed to expose absolutely perfectly. I did not need to tweak the solenoid or uh, any aspect of the uh, shutter assembly other than putting in the 150 picofarad capacitor so it works as it should. Um, I'm going to start work on the second camera now um, but this one I won't make a video of because this one should be pretty boring. This was certainly much more of an interesting job. And I hope you guys liked the video, uh, even if there were multiple interruptions once again. That is, of course, the downside to uh, trying to record videos from home whilst you're, uh, uh, whilst you're unable to control every single element. But I'd like to thank those that stuck with it and made it to the end of the video. Um, I've already sent pictures of the camera through to David, who is stoked with uh, the job that we uh, ended up doing. And basically, um, I think this candidate this particular camera was a good candidate for the 600 film because in my opinion 600 film is just such a more usable type of film that I believe what's going to happen is this is going to end up being the camera that gets the most use. The other camera is going to be kept completely original and will likely become somewhat of a shelf queen. More of the uh, collector's item I guess. Whereas this one with its slightly beat up leather I think David's going to have absolutely no worries using this and I hope he adds many scuffs to this thing from regular use to come. Um, but yeah, let us know in the comments below what kind of style of refurbishment do you prefer? Do you prefer totally custom leather, you know, with crazy pinks and purples? Do you prefer your camera to look completely stock and original? Or do you prefer uh, to go all new but in the original style, you know, brand new tan leather, uh, new stickers, all that kind of stuff. What is it that you prefer? I certainly have my preference. This is sort of how I like to do refurbishments the most. Of course, I'm happy to meet my clients' demands anyway. They want a camera refurbished, really. Um, but this is really my style, to completely overhaul the thing mechanically, keep it looking as original as possible on the outside, and basically just maintain that original history of the camera. I'd like to thank you all for watching and thank you once again for all of your support so far. You're a tremendous bunch of people. Um, I can't thank you enough. Every single comment, like, subscribe that I get helps bring me new business and that helps me keep doing what I love and that means that I can keep cranking out the content. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Have a wonderful day. If you want something repaired, hit me up and I'll see you in the next video.